Tuesday, August 15th, 2023. Welcome back to another episode of the Routing for Success podcast. We have a great interview for you today with Steve Rebuck, a service provider who operates eight CSAs on the pickup and delivery side of the business. Before we get into that, I wanted to briefly talk about the Forward Summer Summit, which was in Orlando last week. For those of you who weren't able to attend this event, you missed out. I was able to go as an exhibitor, and this event was phenomenal. The organizers at FedEx who put this on, man, it took a lot of prep work, and they really did an amazing job. The venue was nice. The food was great. Everyone there seemed to be having a good time. And even more important than that, they seemed to be getting value from the time that they were there. There was one service provider in particular who I spoke with before the Orlando Summit this person was having a really difficult time. They were feeling dejected. They weren't feeling like a lot of the issues that they were trying to escalate were being heard. I caught up with him at the end of the Orlando Summit, and he had completely 180 And the reason for that, he said, was because he was able to get access to some corporate employees in different departments. These people listened to what he had to say, and he left that event feeling like change may actually happen for him. And he was feeling very optimistic about the business leaving that event, something that he wasn't able to achieve just at the terminal level. So... Uh, for me as an exhibitor, it was definitely worth our time to be there. It's always great to have a forum where we can interact with our customers. I had a chance to meet several of our Routing for Success interview guests in person, David Delgado and a few others. I met with others who I didn't get photos with, but it was really good to put faces to the names or at least in person. And I'm looking forward to being there next year. Welcome to Routing for Success, the show where we interview today's top logistics professionals, giving them a platform to share their stories and best practices. Today, we are talking with Steve Rebuck. Steve is an independent service provider for FedEx Ground who operates eight CSAs. Prior to getting into the last mile logistics business, Steve ran a non-emergency medical transport company where he oversaw 300, a fleet of 300 ambulances and all of their employees. In this episode, we talk about some of the lessons that he learned in the non-emergency emergency medical transport business, some similarities between that industry and what he does today in last mile logistics with FedEx Ground, and much, much more. I'm excited to present Steve Rebuck. All right, we are here with Steve Rebuck. Steve, thanks for being here. Good morning or afternoon, wherever you are. So uh, let's talk about your FedEx business. Give us a little background on yourself. Uh, What was your professional background leading up to becoming a FedEx contractor? Uh, yeah, I mean, I was in the, uh, I had a background in the, you know, like a lot of contractors, uh, corporate life, did that deal for uh, 22 years, I think it was. So I lived, uh, I went to school at Arizona State, moved out to California, and I worked out there for EHI, which is Enterprise Holdings, and they own Enterprise Rent-A-Car, Alamo, and National. And then I moved with them to open up Western Canada, British Columbia in Started with them in 90 and I moved up there in 94 and I spent 17 years in Western Canada, um, which was great. Had a great time up there. And then uh, my 22 years, we split ways, parted ways. And I had already owned uh, uh, basically a winter home in Arizona. So we moved here, uh, which was tougher on my kids. It was easier for, for my wife and I to get out of British Columbia, which we loved. People were fantastic, but you know, it just rained and rained. So moving to Arizona was really good for us. And uh, we got into the non-emergency medical transport business. And it's a business where we took people on stretchers um, or wheelchair to doctor's appointments, uh, hospice care. We did a lot of hospice care. So people, you know, they're in the hospital, they're in hospice and they want to pass at home. So we would go into the hospital and pick them up on a stretcher and move them to their home or vice versa, people don't want people to pass in their home, so we pick them up in their home and take them to a, a care center. So we did a lot of that. Um, we started with four vans. Uh, we grew it to about 30. And then I sold it to a company out of California, and uh, I stayed and ran the company, and we grew it to about 300 vehicles across four states in a couple of years. And it was good because, you know, as you, uh, I sold it to a publicly traded company who had a lot of money, so they had the ability they had the ability to expand and the capital to help us expand. So we did that. So I stayed with them and then, you know, but I was back in corporate when I went back to work, when I sold to them and then I ran the company for them, I was still in the corporate world and, you know, expectations that didn't necessarily meet mine or, you know, some of the things that they wanted to do that that we just 
just, you know, when you're in corporate, I wanted to go back to owning my own business. And before I got into the NEMT business, I looked at FedEx and this would have been in about 2012. Uh, in hindsight, I wish I would have done it. Uh, I wish I would, you know, the NEMT business was really good for us, but um, I was really thrown off by the one-year contract. And the other thing that I was in my, in my professional life is that I did a lot of sales calls, a lot of marketing. And so the NEMT business allowed me to use that skill set to go out and meet with skilled nursing facilities and hospices and hospitals and, and grow the business organically through, you know, a handshake and a smile and really good service. And one of the things that FedEx didn't have, uh, one, it had the one-year contract, and two, it didn't give me the ability to really use the skill set to, um, to expand the business because the packages are the packages and the revenue is the revenue, um, with the exception of, um, you know, when I got into this deal four years ago, um, there wasn't a lot of free stuff going around. So really to expand, it took capital and it took, you know, SBA loans and putting everything on uh, your homes in, into it and you're getting your 401ks involved. And so, um, you know, growing uh, FedEx was was going to be difficult. So that was a bit of a turnoff for us that we weren't going to be able to grow. So um, as I sold the NEMT company, I was kind of wandering around looking for the next deal. And I, my business partner um, now today, who I was with it, at EHI as well, um, decided, hey, let's do this FedEx thing. So we spent about six months um, flying around the country, talking to different people, uh, San Francisco, Texas, uh, Oklahoma, Missouri, Arizona, Colorado. We just we wanted to understand the one year deal really spooked us, right? Uh, the one year contract. So we really want to understand what it looked like, um, how difficult it is to really lose your business, what all that really looks like. And then we um, tried to understand, do, do we want to be a rural um, type of provider or do we want to be an urban provider? Do we want to be a mix? Um, we ultimately settled on being a rural provider uh, just because we thought there were more variables involved. And as there's more variables, there's more opportunity, we thought, for um, uh, for growth and for, uh, to make more money. So we looked at a bunch of different deals. We, we had a deal in Texas. We flew down to sign the paperwork and the contractor didn't show up, uh, decided he didn't want to sell. Uh, and in Cypress, Texas, which is really growing just outside of Houston, we were really excited about the area. We just couldn't get it put together. So we, uh, fell back on a deal in Pueblo, Colorado, um, which, uh, was, 100% rule. We were doing about 8,000 miles a day through the entire CSA. So it was a really big, vast CSA that ran out towards Oklahoma, Kansas, New Mexico. And uh, we really liked it. We got started just before peak. Um, actually, we started the Saturday before peak, uh, and I guess in 2019. And then we ran contingency in the terminal that very same peak. Uh, which we really loved because we understood how you can make some extra money. And then we jumped into our next CSA in f April of 2020. And that was about the time that, that COVID was coming. Or, and so it started to get really, really busy, really, really hectic. Um, but that's when we got into our second deal. And, and uh, so since then, we haven't, um, we haven't purchased anything. Everything's been um, given now with the exception of the second deal. Everything else has been given to us. Um, as an award. And uh, so we've kind of grown organically that way through, through awards. And we haven't, uh, we did purchase one deal in Tucson um, and subsequently rolled out of that one, but everything else has been awards. And today we run, what is it? One, two, three, four, uh, eight CSAs. And then we just started to get into line hall. We have one line hall with one more coming here shortly. So um it's been a bit of a whirlwind over the last four years, and we've made every mistake you could make. Um, the very first mistake we probably made was when we went out and met with all of these senior managers all over the country. We said, you know, you got a million bucks. You buy line hall or you buy P&D. Every single one of them, every single person in the office said line hall. And we're like, ah, we're smarter than you. We'll figure this out. And we jumped right into P&D. Um, in hindsight, you know, line hall pro probably would have been the way to go. Uh, P and D's been good. It's, uh, I'll say, it's you know, getting through COVID and some of the things we've gotten through um, has certainly tested our metal. But I think uh, it's made line hall. I wouldn't say easier, but it's 
made the transition a bit easier for us. And we still want to grow in line hall. We still think there's tons of opportunity there. Um, we like some of the things that are happening there. Uh, but just in terms of controlled chaos, uh, line hall is kind of a set and forget type of deal. And it's, you know, keep the trucks running, keep the drivers happy, pound the miles. So, um, so far it's been easier, but you know, uh, P P and D still high on. So that's, yeah, that's kind of the background corporate deal moved into this with a really great business partner. We have surrounded ourselves with really smart people, really good BCs and, um, it's made it way easier for us. So non-emergency medical transport business, you sold that company to a big, you know, big publicly traded organization. You stayed on to run it, got it up to 300 vehicles. So, you know, at least at a high level, sounds like you had experience managing a fleet of vehicles. I mean, 300, that's a pretty big number. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, same thing. It was, it was organized a lot like, uh, you know, we had an op, we had an operation, uh, you know, different operations in Arizona and then we had Houston, um, we had Idaho and all um, we serviced, we went up to Las Vegas, but it was the same type of deal. BCs, cars and people, right? It wasn't overly complicated. We had to have cars and we had to have people. We had to have cars that ran. Um, it was way more complicated than FedEx. I mean, uh, the problem with, you know, P&D, I would say is, is a little like an EMT in that we don't control a lot, right? I mean, uh, but in EMT, we don't control the traffic. We don't control the weather. We don't control the doctors, the nurses. We would walk into people's rooms to pick them up and they'd still be sleeping. So we got to help get them ready, which we're not trained to do. So we have to go find somebody. And, and uh, you know, you get them to a doctor's office. Doctors now are behind, but you got somebody else you have to pick up. So there's a ton of moving parts. Um, and it's always our fault. You know, the family's upset because we were late for the pickup, but we're late for the pickup because the doctor we knew was going to be on time. So, um yeah, it was just a lot of moving parts, and uh, but we had op we had operators in each one of these deals like BCs that kept the flow going, right? Hiring good drivers, making sure the fleet was prepped and ready to go because you can't break down roadside in Arizona at 115 degrees, right? The car's got to run, uh, especially when somebody's in the on a stretcher and they're imminent or they're passing, um, and the family wants them to be home to pass. I mean, you got to make sure your equipment's ready to go, and you're going to get them there. Um, and, you know, never had not never had a problem uh, getting somebody home. So, you know, the, the, the problem with the NEMT is always our fault. No matter what happened, it was our fault for for being late. Or sometimes we'd get them home way after dinner. We get them to the care facility after dinner's been served and they're upset with us. Well, they also sat in the doctor's office two hours later than they were supposed to. Right. And then so and it's kind of like P&D, you know, that the frustrating thing about P&D is that it doesn't matter what happens in the FedEx world. We have to fix it. And it's one of those things where I don't say people don't care, but it's one of those, they don't care, fix it, right? Get the packages out. So if the hub's behind or weather's a problem or line holes a problem, it doesn't matter. When they hit the terminal, it becomes our problem. And the terminal is short staffed, doesn't matter. So that's a lot like the NEMT. So that's probably made my transition a little bit better and knowing that understanding that it really just, it depends on us. We can't depend on anybody else. Uh, and that's kind of the mentality that we take is that it's really um, it just becomes our problem. So we can complain about it or you can just handle the packages and get them out and standing on the belt bitching about it isn't going to get the packages out. So you first heard about FedEx contracting back in 2012, but you didn't actually pull the trigger and become a contractor service provider until 2019. You'd said there were some things that had turned you off about the business model originally uh, but what changed from 2012 to 2019? Um, probably, well, financially, I was in a different position, to be honest with you. I mean, um, buying something with the one-year contract in 2012, um, you know, you make a mistake. I don't know if I could have recovered from that. Once I sold my company and I had a little bit of cushion to, I guess, make a mistake, if there was one to be made, um, put me a little more at ease. And then as we just started talking to people, it was really, you know, understanding that FedEx isn't looking to take the business from you. Um, all you got to do is deliver the packages. And it came down again. We looked at it. We said, my business partner, Mark, and I, we looked at it and said, we need trucks and we need people. And it sounds simple. Um, and it's it's way more than that. And I understand that. But if we can just keep trucks running, um, you know, when we got our first CSA, our fleet had an average miles of 406,000 miles on it. Great 
contractor. He had ran it by himself. Um, he set us up fantastic for peak that year. He actually still works for us and he's a great person. Um, but he fixed everything himself, right? He was a guy out of Minnesota that could really, I mean, he could launch a rocket if you tell him to, he just, he was really good at doing that stuff. And I'm not a mechanical guy. Um, so we had to kind of change that. Right. And so, um, understanding uh, capital outlays, what it was going to cost us to change, understanding what it could cost us if you lost your business. But having, I guess, a little more financial cushion on the backside probably helped me make that decision. Plus, I'm uh, my business partner, Mark. Um, as we talked to people, we kind of put ourselves at ease and we felt like, um, you know, there's whatever, six or 7,000 people and and they obviously are doing it right. So if they can do it right, we should be able to, to, to do it right as well. So um, it just kind of, uh, ease our anxiety a little bit. Um, and then getting put in with Roger really helped as well because he helped that transition for us go really well. One of the other things I want to ask you more about, Steve, you talked about how you took a look at the business and you arrived at the conclusion that rural routes, that there might be more opportunity there compared to, you know, more dense uh, routes in a city, for example. I've typically heard the opposite. You know, we, we brought a guy onto this podcast. I think it was episode number seven. He had Times Square, New York as his route. And right. uh, the other contractors in the terminal nicknamed it the Ferrari of FedEx routes because his trucks were driving four or five miles per day total. I think. I think it was something super, super low like that. Uh, but they were just had huge buildings and it was a ton of volume with very little wear and tear on the vehicles themselves. And I've heard other contractors too talk about how, you know, it's easier to make money if you have a densely populated area compared to sending a van out in the boonies to drive 350 miles in a day. Right. Why was your uh, perspective different on that or, or has your perspective changed over the years or do you still feel like rule is the way to go? Yeah, I think we, we think rule is the way to go. I mean, ultimately we've done the urban deal. Um, yeah, you know, those, those Ferrari deals like that, I've never ran one. They could be fantastic. Um, because yeah, you're not putting a lot of miles, right? Um, and so the capital outlay is, is, is much tighter. We did, we ran one in Tucson. Um, you know, we had, so I don't know what it was, 14 routes a day, did six or 700 miles. It was, it was just, it was for us, it was kind of boring, to be honest with you. Uh, we had really great employees, which made it great because they showed up every day, but it was just one of those, uh, and we just couldn't make any money, right? We had to continually uh, uh, compress the routes um, because you had to get more and more stops on the trucks, right? And then with the size of the trucks, uh, we were jamming stuff in the aisles and it just became the drivers got really frustrated. And because you can't run 140 stops in a heavy density area and make any money, you got to run 180 to 200. Um, that's what I've been told. Um because we didn't make any money doing it, but we just couldn't get uh, we just couldn't get the packages on a lot of the trucks, and so then we ended up adding more trucks and more routes, and um, you know, and again we made a little bit of money, but it just wasn't you know it's the old saying the juice just wasn't worth the squeeze. So with us with rural routes, um, we don't have all the answers. I'll tell you that. I mean, we continue to learn. I mean, every like I said before, every mistake you can make, we've made. We. We thought, okay, let's just go use trucks. We have our own shop. We'll repair them because that's what Roger did. And then, uh, no, and then we just said, okay, let's go all new trucks. It's going to be great because we're going to replace 40 trucks and we're going to have no maintenance and or min less maintenance. Um, but, you know, they still get beat up. The biggest problem with rural routes, um, some of them are really good. The contracts are really, really good. And some of them are just terrible because I don't think that that – uh, Pittsburgh knows how to value them correctly. Um, and so, you know, we've got CSAs right next to one another that that are completely inverted in what they should be getting in terms of contract revenue. And I think it's really hard for them to understand how to value a contract. If you get a good contract, rule routes run really well. Um, the key is you have to know, and with our NEMT company, we knew at 250,000 miles, we were going to blow a transit engine and we knew at 150,000 miles, we were going to put in a new, or I'm sorry, 150 was a transmission, 250 was an engine. And we built that into our models. This is how long we were going to run it. This is what we we're going to invest in it. And we were going to roll out of it. And so I kind of took that mentality to FedEx. The problem is with my NEMT company, I was running around cities all day on concrete. You don't get that 
you know, in rural routes, unfortunately. So, I mean, you know, the new transits, the wiring's falling out of them and bumpers are jiggling off and, you know, they're, they're made out of aluminum foil, basically. They dent on the, so uh, it's a lot different model. So we learned from that, like transits don't work for us. And we go to 12,000 feet up in the Rocky Mountains. So, you know, we need all wheel drive. And so we, you know, that we start talking about dual wheel and, and single wheel. And so we've tried it all. But um, the reason why we settled on, I know it's a long answer to a short question, but the reason why we settled on rule is that if it's contracted right uh, or, or the contract is right and you control the variables, um, the breakdowns and the maintenance and the number of hours that your drivers are on the road, we think we have a formula that works pretty well. And all of our CSAs that are in rural areas are, are doing well. So, um, you know, we have taken CSAs and given them back. Uh, we have been awarded CSAs that just didn't work and we had to give them back. Um, and we learned the hard way there. You know, again, a little bit of arrogance. We thought, yeah, if we think we could make it work, even though the contract was less than a million dollars. I don't believe that to be true now. I don't think there's any way you make a profit on a rural route under a million dollars. And I'm sure somebody will say, well, I am somewhere out in the middle of nowhere, but they're probably running the routes themselves, doing some of the mechanical work themselves. I'm a complete hands-off owner. I don't, I'm, I'm not involved in the business day to day. Um, we've got people that we surround ourselves with really smart people that are running it for us now. So, um, but if you're running less than a million dollars a year, you're probably putting in a lot of work. Um, and not that that's a bad thing, but you're probably in the truck more than you should be because you're not hiring people. You're probably under the hood more than, than you should be because you're not taking care of your business and uh, helping yourself grow. And ultimately, if your goal is to be a million dollar contractor here, it's going to be a pretty solemn. It, you just kind of bought yourself a job and, and that's OK if that's what you want. But I think I would argue that most contractors that are with FedEx want to grow and um you know, build a bit of a legacy plan for themselves and, 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 you know, they're with their business partners or their family or whatever. I don't think anybody really comes here to aspire to be a, you know, run seven routes for life, you know, forever and be in a truck. Um, some, some may, but I would think the vast majority want to grow. And with rural routes, not a lot of people like them. So when they become available as awards, um, people, tend to shy away from them um, because they're, they are more work. I'm not going to lie. They're, they're a lot more work, but um, we think the formula that we, that we have helps us uh, find the margins that we need to make it work. Tell us a little bit more about the formula. I mean, you've been, you've been talking about the business successes, failures, some things that you found work, but if you were to distill the formula down. Yeah. I mean, it's not rocket science. I think there's, there's contractors out there that have probably figured this out a long time ago. It took, it took us four years uh, and a lot of questions uh, we asked a lot of people, but, um, you know, part of it is, um, you know, a lot of guys run all these four wheel drive vehicles and ultimately we're required to, to deliver the packages. But um, then it comes down to, OK, do I need a, a 1500 or do I need a 2500 or do I need a 3500? Like, how big a truck do I need to run? Um, and we just got into the mentality that, you know, we don't build churches for Easter. So we're not going to buy fleet that we might use for a couple of months or three months. We buy a fleet that we think we can get the most mileage out of if we take care of it. Um, we go with single rear wheel um, because we find that duels are heavier. They sink more in the sand that we're in and the dirt and the snow. Plus, you're replacing twice as many tires or, you know, uh, four instead of two. Um, our drivers like them better. Um, and we've tried to stay, you know, we did the whole transit experiment. They just don't work in the rural routes where we are. The rural routes and the roads where we are, um, we just shake them to pieces. Um, and then we ultimately, uh, we do run a couple of space caps with pickup trucks and four wheel drives, but we've kind of just said that if a box truck can't get there, then we need to get the customer involved to help us out because we're not going to put somebody in peril for a package. Um, there's probably roads that we shouldn't be on. Um, and so if our, if our box truck get, can't get down that road, uh, we need to live to fight another day. And what we don't want is guys in four wheel drives out there bouncing down the roads and, it might be fun, but it's not productive and it's really not someplace we should probably be. So what we do is we try to buy the same fleet um, and, you know, we tried the Chevy thing. We tried the Ford thing. I can't tell you which is better, but we do keep try to keep the same fleet in one CSA. So in Missouri, we might run all Chevy. Uh, New Mexico, we might run all Ford. 
Uh, just for simplicity with our shops, we were ordering the same tires, the same parts. When something happens, we had an issue with the Chevys. We knew that they was all going to, that was, it happened on two of them. So we knew it was something that was probably going to happen with all of them. So we ordered the parts ahead of time or tried to get the parts ahead of time for the dealer. Um, so it just helps us identify some, some certain things. So we try to keep the same type of fleet um, in the CSAs. So it um, kind of the Southwest Airlines model, right? All they run is 737s. Um, we don't do that, but we do try to keep in the CSA, keep the certain type of model there if possible. Uh, and we still, you know, we're not perfect at it. Um, you know, things break down and we'll move one uh, a truck from one CSA to the other and we got to gotta change it up. But, um, you know, we run only Ford and all of our C CSAs, we only run Ford uh, um, P's. Uh, and we do run some, you know, we do run some urban stuff. We do have towns where we run P's and that kind of thing. So we only run Fords there. Again, same thing. If something goes wrong, it's going to typically go wrong in the rest of them, and we can try to get ahead of the problem. Um, and then the other thing that the reason why we like rule, um, to be honest, is because I can get my wife to go out and deliver, you know, who's 110 pounds. She can go out and deliver um, 60 or 70 stops a day. That's not a big deal, right? But trying to get somebody to go out and jump 180 or 190 times a day, that's a, that's that takes somebody kind of special, right? It's tough. Um Look, I'm 56. I wouldn't, I don't know that I could jump 180 times a day. So our pool of employees becomes uh, much, much bigger, especially in the rural areas where I could hire uh, a Jenny or a Jody or whoever and say, hey, I need you to go out three days a week and run 70 stops. And she has no problem doing it. Uh, we can find part time people that want to go out because it's windshield time. Uh, we have some routes that do 300 miles and 25 stops. Trying to find somebody for that route is really easy. That's not, that's not a hard job to feel. So with, with uh, the ability to hire from a, uh, a larger pool of people and run them kind of in the same truck. So they're all trained in the same thing, running the same direction. It's made um, our maintenance costs come down and it's made our training much better. Um, you know, we're gold and one CSA, we're silver and everything else. But, you know, a year ago uh, we had some real safety challenges and, uh, it, it just, yeah, it just came from trying to run too few of people too many miles. And what we found is that as we ran less miles with more routes, curbed the overtime, really, really brought down the accidents, which sounds like common sense, but um, it did. And so it's where we gave it up on the front end. We're getting it back on the back end now in terms of uh, being able to go out and get free deals because we're gold and silvers and we're not trying to chase away an OTC, right? Um, so you might spend the money on on the front end over staffing a little bit, but it enables you to capture some revenue through awards and stuff on the back end by doing it right. And like I said, it was one of those things we learned and guys that have been with FedEx for, you know, three months or 30 years, you know, they may know that and they probably are like, oh, well, no, you know, no shit, Steve. Um, but we tried a bunch of different models um, and it just, this is the one that works for us and it may not work for everybody, but um more routes, less miles, same vehicle. Um, uh, and it's just, like I said, it's brought our safety scores up. And, uh, you know, we're chasing we're chasing gold in a couple of other places. So we're pretty excited about that. Do you feel like it's easier to retain your workforce with rural routes compared to city routes? Gosh, I don't know. I mean, some city guys um, have some really good drivers that have been doing it for a really long time. Um, and I think that it might be easier in the sense that they're kind of seeing the same place all day. You know, when we run two, 300 mile routes, you see a lot of the same people, but a lot of it's different. You know, I don't know. I think for us, I think with anything, really, I think if you make it a manageable work day, it's easy to retain people. Right. Um, I mean, I live in Arizona. How the guys in Phoenix keep guys jumping 160 or 180 stops a day in 115 degrees. I don't know. God bless them. Um, you know, our guys might jump out, drop a package on a doorstep, get back in the air conditioned box truck and drive eight, 10, 15 miles to the next stop. So they're not overheating and jumping, you know, five times in a cul-de-sac. Um, so I think it might be easier, but I, I don't know. Um, like I said, I think the guys that know what they're doing in the urbans probably do it really well and they're good to hanging on to them. But for us, um, Turnover was a problem again until we started saying we're just going to run more. We're going to run more routes, which 
you know, is a, is problematic because you get, you get caught in that efficiency thing with FedEx. And when you go back to negotiate and they say, well, you know, you're running 18 routes, you should be running 13. Um, but I think um, it might cost us a little bit of money, but what, based on what we've seen just in the last 18 months with our safety scores uh, and our training programs, it's it's been well worth it. So um, retention's gotten way better for us as well because we're not – people aren't out, out, out till 7 o'clock. I mean, our BCs really press um, our guys to be in the building by 5. And it's easier said than done. I mean, especially when you're dealing with weather and we deal with snow everywhere we are. So um, – and we deal with – you know, for us, it's like a lot of other contractors, I think, where – you know, it sucks because you lose one and the next thing you know, you're down four and then you get caught in this doom loop, right? Where you're down four and now everybody's working more hours and they're frustrated and you're trying to hire and they quit because they're frustrated because they're out there 12 hours and you're, you know, then you're panicked and you're, um, the good thing for, for us is that we can move, uh, we can move pieces around a little bit from one CSA to the other. We have drivers that love to travel, um, and that's helped cure the turnover because we do get into a problem. We can, you know, we can uh, kind of flood the ice with, with drivers. But, um, yeah, I, I, for me, I think it would be easier to retain guys uh, on rural routes because it's it's really, it's, you know, it's your big gulp, your sports radio and the road, right? You're just out there and uh, you're delivering your, you know, 60, 70, 80, maybe 100 stops. And uh, it's windshield time. So, uh, and, you know, the thing that's good for us is that uh, – you know, I'm from Nebraska, uh, not to hammer on Nebraska, but uh, there's not a lot to see there, right? So our drivers, we're in the mountains of Colorado. It's beautiful. Uh, we cover, you know, we cover north of Durango. It's, so it's, we really have some beautiful, beautiful routes. So I think the drivers um, can kind of take that in as well. And whether that adds to retention, I, I have no idea, but we've had a really good run this last year. Steve, you talked about how you don't feel like, in most cases, a CSA that does less than a million dollars a year in top line revenue is probably going to be a viable business unless you really want to buy yourself a job and you're going to be hands on. What do you think the sweet spot is? I mean, is it a million? I mean, is it, you know, if someone's thinking about getting into this business and they're looking at a contract, would you, would you recommend to them as long you as know, you know, if I was, if, yeah, first time coming in, um, I think that sweet spot, you know, you uh, probably that 1.6, 1.7 million range somewhere in there. Um, if you can get a $2 million deal, um, I guess better, especially with, with Express coming. Um, but I think that kind of that sweet spot to learn on your first one uh, would be that 1.6 to $7 million range. I think there's enough of a margin. You know, the problem is, is that FedEx, we don't know what they margin this thing out to. Let's say 10%. Because I, I believe that's kind of the number. But I also believe that they, they, they base that number based on perfection, that everything goes well in your life in that day and that year, which is just not going to happen. Right. Um, so I think they base it on perfection. So it's really a, you know, maybe an 8%, 7% margin for you. The problem is coming in, if you have a debt service and let's say 10%, so I can do easy math on a 1.6, you're at 160,000. Um, you know, that's not a horrible job. $160,000 a year is a, you know, that, that's very respectful and that's a, that's a decent job. And you probably are hiring some BCs and you're surrounding yourself with some people so that you can actually enjoy yourself and go on a vacation and and uh, put some pl- uh, processes in place that will maybe drive that 10 to 12 percent. Um, so that kind of works. You can save some money. The downside is you got to figure out what that 1.6 is costing you, right? Because you're going to have a, if you have a debt service um, and then you look at the cost of the trucks and the trucks aren't getting any cheaper. Well, nothing's getting any cheaper. Um, you kind of have to look at that and say, okay, on 160,000 and I've got, you know, uh, $60,000 a year in debt service. So now I'm at a hundred grand. Can I, can I work for a hundred thousand dollars a year for the next five, seven, 10 years, whatever, however long you negotiate your, your debt service, uh, SBA would be 10 years, but you have to make that decision. Can I, can I do that? Cause revenue is going to probably move a little bit. It's going to go North, maybe not every year, but over the next 10 years, you're going to, you're going to find more revenue. Uh, but you have to ask yourself, am I going to be okay making a hundred thousand dollars a year, um, running this business for the next two, three, four years? And I'm going to be heavily involved. And, um, and ultimately you want to be able to save some money, perform really, really well. So if you want to get awarded some stuff, you can get some stuff because, um, I think that's where you can start to, um, make some money is when there's some awards. Um, but I would, going back to your original question, I think, you know, 1.6, anything less than that, it's tough. I, I just, 
I don't believe for a second you can make money at a million bucks. I just, I, I don't, I don't buy it. Um, not with everything that's going on and, uh, the cost of labor and the cost of repair and trucks. And, and I know there's going to be somebody out there who says you're wrong and, and God bless them. They can do it. Um, but not on the model I want to run. Uh, I don't want to be in a truck. So I just think anything less than a million bucks. And I've been in a truck, mind you. I've done it. Um, it's tough work. <laughs> That's why I don't want to do it. But uh, I think less than a million, there's no, there's, there's, no, I don't think it works. Uh, 1.6. I think you can. Uh, I think you can survive. You can pay yourself well. You can surround yourself with some people to help out, so you're not in your business 365 days a year, um, and you can actually enjoy your life a little bit and, and put yourself in position to maybe find some awards and, and and grow a little bit. What are some other things that you look at when you're examining a CSA and determining whether it's an area that you want to go into? And, and Steve, if you could do me a favor, I guess it's really. You kind of have to split your line of thinking between if you're looking at purchasing a business and you're going to have a big capital outlay, uh, you know, that's really just blue sky, not counting the trucks and everything else that that takes capital to get a new CSA going or to take over um, com- compared with if you're getting one for free, you know, or at least no blue yeah. sky, and you only need to provide the trucks and personnel to show up. Well, but what are some things you look at when you're taking a look well, at these opportunities? One, th- one thing I'd never do is I'd never, I, I, I'm on an SBA on our original deal. I'd never do that right now. You would never get me to sign an SBA right now with everything that's going on. Um, uh, I think you're in big trouble if you do it. So I would advise against it. The only way I would ever, uh, the only way we're going to grow is through award. Now, that said, we have had contractors come to us that are in trouble and said, hey, take over my fleet payments, pay me X. Uh, over a X amount of time uh, and take over it. It's usually been in the same terminals where we've been. We've done one outside of a terminal where we where we, where we weren't originally at. So something like that where it's an owner carry back. Um, I just, at this stage in the game, there's no way you would convince me to take out an SBA to, SBA to buy something. I think that's um, um, anybody advising you of that is probably not being genuine, to be honest with you. And what, um, why is that? So what changed in recent years where SBA from your your point of view was viable a few years ago, but today you wouldn't even think about it. Because I think um, one, well, are you, if you're talking about just getting into getting into the business, I think there's enough guys out there. Look, there's enough, I'll call them old timers because they're the guys that that have been doing this forever, right? There's enough guys out there that um, have been doing this forever, run a really good business. I know one in Kansas. Um, I would love to take his business uh, or, work a deal with him. It was, I've been talking to him for four years, uh, but really good guys, does a great business, but ultimately you've got express coming, right? And you've got all of this other stuff coming that um, is going to pile on. It's going to get really, really tough. You've got metals coming in. Um, you've got um, volume consistency plans that are going to be making their way into the, into the network. So there's things that, um, are going to, I won't say force, but there's going to be older guys that just aren't going to want to do it, right? The guy I bought from four years ago, that was his deal. It's like, Steve, all the automation, everything, I just don't want to do it. So um, um, he decided to get out that time. And I think there's going to be a lot of that coming. So I think that putting your house and throwing in your 401k and running out to grab an SBA on something that you don't even know if you're going to own three years from now, four years from now, five years, we have no idea what the landscape's going to look like. So um, I think anybody telling you to do that is being disingenuous and you should run. Um, um, and I think that if you can find a really good business where you have an owner contractor that's been running it and he's been doing it for years, I think that you can work and you could, you could probably negotiate a deal with that, with that contractor that is viable to him and to you. There's some tax advantages to it. Um, so I think there's going to be enough opportunity out there for people not to have to um, sacrifice their family and some of the other things that might go along with, with buying into a bad deal. I just you shouldn't do it. Don't do it. Um, other than that, I think there are going to be opportunities. I, I'm personally a, a fan of FedEx where we're at. You know, we're getting in the line hall, but I like P&D. I love the whole express thing that they're talking about. I love the... Um, opportunities that, that are going to, that are going to come from that. And I, um, and I look forward to talking to guys that want to get out of the business and say, Hey, buy my trucks and 
um, help me get out of this deal and, and we'll do that. Right. We've done that. We're in the middle of doing that now. So, um, and I think not just me, but I think there's other contractors that would love to do that, do that type of deal. Um, there's some really good contractors, um, that have their, their model works really well for them. And I think if they spend some time, um, and what, that's what I do mostly, to be honest with you, I don't spend a lot of my time in business. I spend a lot of my time talking to contractors in terminals, um, talking to connections, talking to business brokers on guys that might want to sell, but they um, they can't find a buyer because people aren't running out to grab SBAs and there might be secondary ways to make it work. So we look through growth that way. Um, and I think that's the best way to protect yourself, especially if you're a new guy coming in. Um, don't get caught up in everything that's going on right now. If Express is going to be really good. I think it's going to add value. Um I just don't know what that value is going to look like three or four years from now. So I don't want you to um, put everything, you know, put all of your eggs in one basket here in case something, in case things start and things have changed a lot in four years for me. So for me to pretend like I know what's going to happen four years from now, eh, I have no idea. I can, I can hear the rumors. Um, I hear the talk. I know what people are saying. Uh, I don't want to get caught up in that, but um, I think somebody that's, uh, yeah, I just I would be very careful before I I uh I jumped in with an SBA loan right now. If you can even find it. I don't know if there's a lot of SBA lenders doing it. You know, Steve, I've been told that it it's a heck of a lot harder to obtain financing to buy a FedEx business today than it was just a few years ago. Um, you know, there was negative publicity, you know, last summer uh just around the entire model and uh you know, I think a lot of banks probably looked at that and said, you know, maybe we shouldn't be lending. That's just a guess, but so, yeah, so what would you I say mean, for someone brand new trying to get in? It's like, you know, you wouldn't recommend doing SBA, putting up your house and really putting all your chips in the middle of the table, um, you know, and but a lot of people come into this business, you know, they may not have a network of wealthy people, you know, be able to present an investment opportunity to them. How do they get in? How, how do they find? Well, I think, you know, and I can tell you that there's some really good business brokers out there and I'm I'm not down on business. I mean, I I. A lot of information, a lot of talk is with business brokers. They know what's going on, right? So I, I, I talk to them a lot. And there's some really, really good ones. And there's some really, really bad ones. Um, I dealt with 13 of them before I bought my first deal, right? But there are some really good ones. And they're extremely creative. And they know how to get people into the business, right? Um, and I think that if you talk to the right broker, I think they're going to get the right people into the business. Um, I don't... Again, I don't think they're going to bring bring people in to fail, right? I mean, let's look. Think about it. Two years ago, FedEx had this grand plan that they were going to bring in a bunch of new contractors, right? A bunch of five and six and seven um, route deals, smaller deals, smaller scale, selling these deals to, to guys. Uh, we were bringing in Amazon drivers and we were bringing in, um, you know, guys without a lot of wealth. Not that you have to be wealthy, but not a lot of capital to back them up. And where are they today? They're probably gone or very close to being gone or headed towards being gone, right? So it was a bad plan and some guys got hurt for it, right? And some families got hurt for it. And that's, and that's, and that's tough, right? That, that's a tough deal. And that's my biggest, I guess, frustration with FedEx is that you have to care about the people coming into this business. And, you know, there is buyer beware. It's some of those, hey, it's your own problem if, if you buy into a bad deal but they're buying into deals based on a program that FedEx put in front that we're going to make smaller CSAs. And it was a dangerous precedent, right? And so now these guys are out there and you got business brokers that sold a bad deal and you got contractors that got out, which is nice. Um, But I think that if you just slow down and you talk to a broker or you talk to a contractor, because there's a lot of really good contractors that will, that will carry the note or they'll carry it with a modest amount down or they will help you, get into the business. Their biggest concern is they don't want you screwing the pooch and ruining their CSA, right? And losing the CSA. But I think like, you know, there's guys out there, like the guy we bought from this gentleman in Kansas that I know, he's run a really good business for a really long time. And if he were to sell to his BCs and do a carry back or sell to someone else to do a carry back with the same, you know, with the stipulations that his BCs have to stay. And um, he's got like any bank, he's got insight to the books and he can, he can look at the he can look at the volume and he can look at the P and Ls just like every I mean the SBA does it to us every quarter they need to see where we're at so if I'm carrying the note 
I'd want to see all that. So if you keep the business close to you and you're carrying that note, um, I think there's a way for you to graduate out of the business and bring somebody else in. Somebody that's probably really good, really hungry, and knows what they're doing. It just has to be a model that works. It can't be a million dollar model. It can't be, you know, you're not going to be able to carve out five or six or seven shitty little routes for them because you're going to get those back, right? And then um, you're doing that person a disservice. You're not being genuine with them. And that's not fair. Um, so I think if we just all keep it on the up and up and we um, talk to people like brokers that know how to get people into the business and they can direct them in the right way, um, I think you'll be fine. And and or um, talk to contractors. But buying it, you know, I talk out of both sides of my mouth because we bought deals where guys – we're going, they couldn't make it work in, in the in the terminal where we were. So for us, we looked at it as scale, right? We looked at it um, a little bit different. But if you're, if you're getting into a deal where a guy can't make it work in, you know, Tulsa, Oklahoma, don't think you're going to come in and make it work, right? Because um, it's trucks and people. And, uh, but I think um, there are opportunities for contractors and they all know there's, there's opportunities for contractors when you're in a terminal that you can add scale um, and you just kind of fold it into your existing business. And there's not a lot of additional expense. So that works. And I think if somebody were to get in on that $1.6 million deal and they could get an owner carry back and they could get in a terminal and understand it um, slowly grow. Um, I think the next four or five years will be really exciting. I really do. I think there's tons of opportunity for people. And uh, um, I think there'll be people looking to exit because um, it's going to be a lot of work. And maybe that's they have to put in their life. They've worked their ass off. They don't they don't they don't need a lot of work right now. Um, but there are exit there are exit plans out there. Pivoting a little bit, uh, you know, we take emails from listeners who listen or watch the podcast and want to submit questions. Uh, we had a listener submit a question. This was uh, John from Hewitt, Texas. So, John, if you're listening, this is for you. Um, he was asking about what is your strategy for managing payroll? And uh, I'm not talking about payroll systems, but, you know, day to day, there's volume fluctuations. And the numbers that you get for what your volume is going to be for a given week or a given day, it's not always accurate with what actually happens. So you could end up you know, many contractors end up in a situation where they expect a certain amount of volume and then they show up and there's way more volume than they were anticipating. And, you know, now they're trying to scramble and figure out, well, how can I get all these packages delivered? I don't have enough staff. I don't have enough bodies here to handle it. You know, on, on the other end of that spectrum is you have too many people show up, you know, and you, you send people home. They need to put food on the table that, you know, they may be looking for another job if you do that one too many times. Um, Steve, what, what has your experience been? Have, have you learned any lessons that you could speak to when it comes to managing, you know, how many people you need to show up on a day to day basis? Yeah, the first thing I'll say is that we never have a shortage of people that'll go home. Right? If you ask, if you get too many people and say, hey, who, who wants to go home today? You'll find somebody. Um, that notwithstanding, I think, um, you know, DRO has been uh, a bit of a thorn for everybody. And I know they're working hard and I know it, it's getting better. And I, and, um, I used to be really, really involved with DRO because I, I actually, I like conceptually, I like how it works. Um, and I like, um, being able to dig around in it and find efficiencies. But at the end of the day, uh, we came to the conclusion and we can fight with terminals and we can fight with BDS, whoever, but there's probably going to be a delta of 10% either way, right? Cause we're not staying up till two o'clock in the morning. So if it says it's coming in at a thousand, it's either going to come in at 1100 or 900 and those 200 package. That don't make a difference to us if you're running you know, 12 or 13 or 14 routes, right? What what makes a difference, what, what we were doing and it was wrong is that we were constantly trying to cut on the belt the number of routes that we thought we could maximize efficiency on. So every morning we'd come in, DRO would say a thousand and come in at 850 and we'd say, oh Christ, that 150, we got to, we got to split those out amongst four other routes. And we'd have packages strung all over the place. And they needed to be uh, rescanned. And we ended up, it was just a nightmare. So what we went to is just basically said, look, if we're running 14 routes and it comes in light, we're running 14 routes. Go run the routes and come back early because they're paid by the hour. Um, it's going to be a short day. But by the time we start cutting routes all the time and moving packages around and putting them on the wrong trucks and 
And then we come back and we're saying they're 16s and they're not 16s. And then we get, you know, the terminal's upset with us because we're, um, it just was absolute chaos on the belt. And so now our position is, uh, if we cut the route, we're running the route, go run the route. Now, obviously, because we run, you know, 300 mile routes, if I'm running to the furthest point and there's only going to be, you know, a couple of packages on that route, we might, we might carve that. But for the most part, um, even if it's got 20 or 25 routes for the amount of time we stand around trying to cut routes and hang on to other people from the building, wait for them to get out, misload a pack. It's just our whole position is if, if we cut 13, we're running 13. That, that's what we do. And if we have to add one, we will. Uh, but we don't ever, we don't ever, we don't cut at the belt anymore. We don't try to get to 11. Um, and so the driver might get a four hour day and you know what? And the, we pay every week. And what we tell people when we hire them is that over a two week period, you're going to get your 80 hours. It's just going to happen. It just does. Right. So you might be short one week. You might be over the other, but think of it as a two week pay period, which is traditional. Um, you're over two weeks. You're going to get your, you're going to get your 40 hours and you're probably going to get a little overtime um, because we're not good enough to, you know, completely do away with overtime. But um, so that's really what we do is we just, uh, we just got away from all these guys standing on the belt. And the other thing that it did, and we didn't think about it, but every other contractor in the terminal, all their employees, none of them would come to work for us. Right. And it's not that we were poaching, uh, but we had drivers that went to them and then we tried, obviously we tried to get them back. Like, what can we do? We ended up spending more money. This, you know, again, doom loop. Um, but what it was is that we were chaos and it was so calm on the other belts, right? Packages were getting loaded. Trucks were pulling out. There wasn't shit all over the belt. And, you know, where's, where's Lewis? Oh, he's out having a smoke. Where's Jonathan? Oh, he's, uh... so we were losing people and never able to get them back. And then once we stopped cutting all these routes, we just said, if we're running 13, we're running 13, load your truck and get out. Right. Um, it's just made everybody's life easier. Everybody knows they're running that day. There's not packages left over. We got rid of all the 12s and the, you know, the mysterious 16s and uh, all that stuff kind of went away. And so I know that's, again, that's a long answer to a short question, but um, we don't cut at the belt. Uh, the only thing we will do is we'll run support if we're heavy, uh, but we don't, uh, we don't go, we don't try to run less routes. And you know, the call out. So the next question might be is, well, what if you have a call out, you've got to cut that. We, um, we still try not to call it. We will call people in. We will have a BC drive. We will bring our trainer in from the training center to drive. We'll, well, whatever. We try not to, we just try not to cut that thing down because it just, um, uh, and, and that like, you know, we, like a lot of contractors, we overstaff each day anticipating a couple of call outs. It's just the nature of the game. That was helpful. And I, I do have one small correction to make. Michael yeah. from Hewitt, Texas. I, I think I said uh, John or some other name. I, I That was wrong. So Michael, that one was for you. Hopefully that was helpful. Um, you know, we're, we're coming up on an hour, Steve. I appreciate you you spending some time with us. Uh, and, and you and I had spoken on the, fo- the phone, you know, prior to this. And we talked about all kinds of stuff. You know, the gold, gold tier metal system, express volume coming in, uh, uh, capacity based services agreements. Uh, we could talk about this stuff for hours. Is there anything else that you want to talk about while you're here and you have this uh, platform in the ear of other FedEx contractors who are trying to learn more about the business? You know, I guess what I would say is I would, you know, I'm uh, I'm very protective of my business and I'm very protective of our people. And and um, so anytime there's change, there's frustration, right? With, with, with anybody, with any job, with any career, anything you do. And so I think I'm, you know, I have been vocal about some frustration with these changes. And I think um, for me, I don't mind change. I just want to know where the goalpost is, right? And I want there to be transparency. And I think um, I think that we have a lot of really, really good people working for FedEx um, at that mid-management level. Um, and I think they see the frustrations that we're going through in the last year and the whole renegotiations ghost that, you know, they didn't really happen. And, and it was a bit disingenuous that, that whole piece. And, but I think the mid management really want to see a success. And I think, um, and I think they're the key to all contractors and not to say the senior managers aren't, cause I think there's some really, really good senior managers out there too. I think there's some bad ones, um, but I think there's uh, more good than bad. And I think that as we can become more and more transparent, and that's the thing, anytime I get to talk to somebody, um, 
uh, in, in management, I'd say that what contractors want is we just want transparency, right? Change the goalpost, but let us at least let us see it. Don't do it. Don't make us kick a field goal at night, right? Um, and I think that FedEx has got that message. And I think that with this new metals program, which it came out at first, I was like, okay, like everybody else is like, okay, they're out to screw us. How are they going to screw us? Because that's your first, oh, they're out, they're out to get me, right? And I think as you start to digest some of the uh, some of the reality behind it, and I think I would rather have metals dictating things to us versus a senior that was a package handler a year ago, and now he's deciding whether or not he's going to OTC me and take my business away. Um, I always had a problem with that, and I like I like that metals gives us the opportunity. Um, to cure some things and to actually take a hard look in the mirror because a lot of it is our problem. Um, but um, what I would say is I think there's a lot, I really believe that P&D can thrive over the next four or five years. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for people. I think we just need to talk more with mid management and understand that. I think they, I think they're on our side. I mean, I, I believe they're on our side and that they want us to be successful because um we're, you know, we're all they got right now, right? So we need to be successful for them. Um, I think that the C-suite um, isn't, I don't believe they're anti-contractor. I think they're making decisions based on uh, some bad information that they're getting from, uh, I, I don't believe last and final mile. I don't, I just don't believe it. I don't believe they're, I don't believe the methods that they're using. I, I think it needs to be more transparent. I think they need to be open and honest with us where they get in these numbers. I mean, I can give you my P&Ls. I can show you everything. And when they say that doesn't matter, they've got a, they've got a model. Um, so I think that's the frustration is that we just, we're stakeholders in the company, right? We want to do well. I don't want to turn on the TV at Christmas and see that FedEx is the worst delivering company year after year. I, I don't want that. That's not good for my business. That's not good for, you know, as a stakeholder, I want to be successful and I want to do, and I think all contractors do. But you can't continue to keep us in the dark and expect us to run with scissors forever, right? There has to be a point where you say, let's sit down with the contractors. Let's be open and honest. And at the end of the day, the contract might be worth 1.6 and that's all we're going to get. I'm okay with that. Just walk me through the steps on how you got there because I'm telling you 1.6 doesn't work and I'm going to give it back. And then somebody else is going to take it that might be new and he's going to fail. And that's not right. Right. These the people should not be getting into this business to fail. Um, I think we need to do a better job as a community. I think FedEx needs to do a better job as a company at looking after contractors and making sure that we understand that there's a family behind these people and just um, arbitrarily throwing out a number. And I'm not saying our arbitrary is not fair, but whatever number you're throwing out, when you know that it's so thin that this new guy's probably not going to make it and he's got all of his chips in the table and I, I I just have a problem with that. And I think, and I think, um, the more we can talk with mid management and help them understand and, and, uh, and for us to understand too, um, kind of the thought process, I think we all win. And I, and, and if I had anything to say, I guess that, you know, out of frustration or anything else, it's just, I, I want to be a part of FedEx. I want to be a great stakeholder. I want to be a great contractor that throws up a bunch of golds. Um, but I need to, I need to know the track that I'm running on if you want me to be successful. And so I would implore who's ever listening just, just to help us with that. That's all. And I think any contractor would say the same thing. And uh, ultimately the express thing is going to be good. I really, uh, I'm really excited for it. Um, I think that uh, all of us contractors will, will enjoy the upside. Steve, you've only been in this for four years, but you're up to eight P and D CSAs, one of which is gold. Uh, you're now in line hall. You do contingency mm -hmm. work. Uh, where do you go from here? Uh, you know, wherever there's opportunity, right? I know it's a bit of a cliche, but I think, um, I think P and D there's a lot of upside. I think there's, um, I think there's contractors that people like me and other contractors like me can help get out of the business and do it in a way that, um, gets them paid and gets them to recognize the value and the hard work they put in their, in their, into their, into their CSAs over the last 20 years, right? Nobody wants to walk away with this with nothing. That, that's tough, right? So um, I think there's opportunity there. Um, I like line haul. I mean, I really do. Um, 
I'm not a fan of contingency. I be, we do contingency um, mainly in our own terminals and a little bit in the districts. Um, some of it is, um, well, I mean, I'm not gonna lie to you because we make good money doing it on some 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 uh, some deals. But um, I'm not a big fan of contingency. It's just tough on the people, and uh, they're kind of out there on their own. And to be honest, we kind of forget about them when they're there for two weeks and they got families and. I would rather have you home in your terminal. I would rather work at a gold in my terminal than to put three people uh, eight hours away. I'd rather have those three people in my terminal getting me to gold, right? Um, and which pays more compensation to everybody in the terminal. So everybody's, you know, rowing the same way. Um, so I would think, yeah, P any P&D opportunity that comes along. And uh, same thing with Line Hall. I think Line Hall provides great opportunity. I, I think uh, there is simplicity there. You know, it's very expensive. Um, but I will say there's, um, a lot of good banks out there. <laughs> there are good banks and there's good people to align yourself with and there's money out there if you want to grow. So, um, just make sure, make sure you've surrounded yourself with really great business partners like I have and really smart people. Um, you know, I love being the dumbest guy in the room all the time. Um, it, it's exactly the way it should be. So when my team is talking and, and, uh, they're coming up with solutions. That's the way it should be. And, 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 uh, that's what will help us grow. And the other reason why I want P and D, um, to be successful for us is because I want my leads to be able to run their own deal, right? I want, I want my leads to move, uh, to Kansas. I want them to move to New Mexico. I want them to, you know, and we, we move them, uh, but we want them to go where there's opportunity for them, them and their families. So I don't want you to be a lead forever. I don't want you to be a driver forever. If you aspire to be in leadership and you want to run your own deal, let's go. We got a plan for you. We got a program for you. We'll put you in it. And, um, you know, they get compensated based on their, on their well, many factors and let's go. So that's another reason is that we like, um, selfishly, do I win? Sure. I do. You know, who's kidding who? If, if we get to 20 and they're all doing well, then yeah, Steve, Steve and Mark and, and, and our investors win. Um, but so do our, so do our people, right? They, they continue to make more money. They can make the money that they want to make and take care of their family. And, um, that's the way we were brought up in EHI and, um, we're excited about doing it here. Steve, thank you for coming onto the podcast. This has been fun. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. I really do appreciate it. Routing for Success is brought to you by AP Equipment Financing. In today's competitive market, it is essential to acquire the right trucks at a fair price and finance them in a way that makes sense for your business. Leveraging their extensive network of truck and van suppliers, the experts at AP Equipment Financing will help you locate the best deals on step vans, cutaways, panel vans, and more. Deliver them straight to your facility and finance them with low monthly installment options. Click the link in the description or visit APFinancing.com for more information. Routing for Success is an independent production of AP Equipment Financing and is in no way affiliated with or endorsed by FedEx Corporation, FedEx Ground, Amazon, or any other logistics company discussed herein. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Routing for Success.